Hello and welcome to this week's edition of the Politically Speaking Podcast. I'm your host, Chris McDaniel, a reporter with St. Louis Public Radio. Joining me in studio is... Jason Rosenbaum. And... Joe Manis. Guys, how's it going? It's going well. Changing a lot of diapers lately. It's it's crazy (laughs) for the last couple weeks. I'm now more or less off my jet lag from Europe. But yeah, it's crazy... Final couple of weeks with the General Assembly into Only about end of session two and, mode. and a half weeks, right? Well, actually, less than that. Yeah, May yeah. 16th at 6 o'clock, it's all over. That's uh, all she wrote. And yeah. It, it kind of snuck up on me this year. And, well, the, one interesting thing uh, is that it used to be in the old days before you guys were born, they used to be able to stop the clock in Jeff City. And so sometimes, like, they would be there for hours and hours passed the missouri legislature had the ability to stop time yes, yes they wow. did and then that ended i'm thinking 15 20 years ago i think people realized that was a, a pretty a, a, a big abuse of that and there's a lot the of states who still do that there's a lot of states who still stop the clock but not in missouri so at six o'clock that's it that's all yeah. she wrote they, they usually get done at 5 55 because the speaker needs to say some sort of congratulations and they got to prepare to throw all the paper in the air. Yes, yes. <laughs> and actually, if you go to my Twitter feed where I've got me, my, my backdrop is paper in the air. That's actually a picture that I took a couple years ago during one of those paper throwing at the end of session. And my, and my, my background is of the rotunda, which is not as exciting. So, so on this week's show, we're going we're gonna to get to a few topics. And then in the second half of the show, we're going to have uh, House Majority Leader John Deal on uh, so that we can talk about the Income tax cut, uh, right to work. What else did we get to? Trans- Medicaid. Transportation tax. Medicaid, transportation it was tax. The we fa- get to a lot tobacco. of Tobacco. It's the fastest 17 minutes in politically speaking history. <laughs> yeah, just so you know, yeah, deal, deal really gets to the topics. And actually, this was a, a second. We had to do it twice because we had a first for the politically speaking. We'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. <laughs> yes, just so you know, so yeah. you'll hang on to your health is worked out. But before we get to Representative Deal, let's talk a little bit about how we expect these last two weeks to go. Okay, well, I think there's going to be a rush on a variety of bills. Uh, the, For example, the um, Senate is expected to act on a a proposal to put voter ID on the August ballot. The House already has done so. Um, The House and Senate have passed a transportation bill, but I think they have to to put something on the ballot, but don't they have to work out some differences? The Senate version was 0.75% down from 1%, so it has to go back to the House. But my assumption is the House will just pass it as is, and it will go to the ballot because they don't want to have to have it go to the Senate again. Now, right to work, which is this provision that would bar unions and employers from requiring all workers to pay fees or dues if a majority vote to join a union, that uh, the Republicans in the General Assembly also have been trying to get on the August ballot. Uh, The House has passed it, but they've been four votes short of the 82 votes they need to get it to the Senate to act, and time is running out on that. A deal, we'll talk about that later. But, But blocking... The sun on a lot of this is the uh, drama over the tax cut bill, which is now sitting on the governor's desk by um, Friday, May 1st. The governor either has to veto or sign it because it was passed early enough to put in place um, some provisions that require him to do so. So arguably the last two weeks of session could be devoted in part to leaders in the House and Senate particularly the House, scrambling to get enough votes together to override his veto. And then they have the crime bill, which they're going to be doing the same thing, where they put it on his, put him on his desk. He has a couple more days to decide what to do with it, but it's expected he may veto it, and then they'll be trying to override it. So you need 109 votes in the House in order to override. They have 108 Republicans, so that means that they'll need one Democrat to sign over. And that's, and that's for the income tax bill, mm-hmm. as, as far as if— Governor Nixon vetoes the criminal code rewrite, uh, it's widely expected that they will be able to overwrite by by a wide margin. Well, potentially, although Nixon has pointed out um, he's citing some law enforcement concerns that there's a provision in the crime bill that allegedly may weaken standards on Mm -hmm. meth uh, possession or involved in the meth production. So that could potentially peel off some votes on the tax cut thing. It's the governor running around the state pointing out what he alleges is the, quote, fatal flaw. He says that there's this line in the bill that would um, 
eliminate all income taxes on any income over $9,000. Now, Republicans uh, in deal, we'll talk about this later, say that's baloney. Uh, the governor, both sides have trotted out legal experts to back them up. But my point is, I think that fight could uh, slow things down the last couple of weeks if the Republicans are scrambling around trying to get the votes, cause especially if, they, if there's some Republican defectors, because you've had some Republican groups like in Springfield who have mm-hmm. come out against the tax cut bill now. But Jason has this theory. So you want to talk about this theory? Um, I, I, I really don't know if the tax cut is going to block out the sun, per se, because if they are scrambling to try to override that and they're not bringing up the tax cut for, you know, 14 or 15 legislative days, they can walk and chew gum at the same time. They can focus on a lot of other things that, you know, do have the votes to pass or do have enough consensus to where they're getting across the finish line as they're trying to wrangle the votes for the tax cut. And the the other thing is, I mean, if it becomes apparent that they can't override this, as as you'll, we'll find out in, in the show, they may pursue other options and try to pass another version of the tax cut. So that may be an instance where it does take up a lot of time. But I, I think that most likely if an override scenario is going to occur, it'll either happen very quickly and it'll be over and done with or it'll be delayed and they'll be working on other things at the same time. So I'm not really sure it would block out like the legislative process, but I'm sure it'll you know, attract a lot of focus. Yeah, and listeners may want to listen to the end of this podcast because Deal has some interesting uh, explanations of their potential al- alternatives. But the other big issue besides tax cut is the whole question of the transfers, school yes. transfer. It, it's fix. a it's a really big deal. I mean, I think the criminal code revision is a major, you know, legislative achievement of this section session. Um, but I think that if they get a school transfer bill to Nixon's desk, it's probably an even bigger and farther reaching one. Now, Dale Singer, the St. Louis Public Radio reporter, has written about this bill over the last couple of months pretty extensively. And it, it, the backdrop, obviously, is this, this student transfer situation where unaccredited districts in Normandy and Riverview Garden school districts, the students there are going to other districts because of a law that was passed, I think, in the, in, in the 90s that allowed students to transfer to adjoining districts with full tuition attached. If their district is unaccredited. Yes. I, it was, I believe, part of the landmark education bill that, w- that passed when Mel Carnahan was first elected. Yes, that's, that's true. And um, now one of the thing that, things that is, is attracting a lot of focus is this provision within the bill that would include the ability for people in an unaccredited district to go to a private non-sectarian school as one of their options. They can go to like another school within the district. And if that's not possible, I guess they could go to a charter school. I mean, I guess they could go to a charter school or another school anyways, because charter schools are public schools. But it would allow that option. And it's caused a lot of attention because um, Governor Nixon has said pretty forthrightfully that he sees that as a voucher provision. And to be fair to the governor, the governor has been speaking out against vouchers and private school options for for years. Years. I mean, when he was running for election for the first time, he made it clear that he was not going to allow this type of stuff to pass over his veto. So he's being eminently consistent with his advocacy. But I have followed um, this type of debate for a while because typically what has happened when they've tried to pass legislation that somehow had some financial or governmental inducement to make it easier for for somebody in a school district to go to private schools. It's usually just failed outright because there's been too much conflict within the Republican Party in the House, and they never brought it up in the Senate because of filibusters. But I think the paradigm has changed. If you look at the vote of that school transfer bill initially, it was 27 to 5 in the Senate. Right. And I'm thinking that you know, when it gets to the House, it's very possible, though I'm not sure because I haven't counted any votes, it might pass overwhelmingly there. So instead of being an impediment for this entire bill to pass, I think it might actually be the linchpin that ends up not only getting something to Nixon's desk, but I think if the House vote is between like 110, 115, 120, 
I think it'll get overridden and I think it'll be be implemented. But it, it solely depends on whether the Republicans in the House are united on this issue or whether maybe some rural Republicans who are closer to, you know, school boards or superintendents decide not to vote for it because of their advocacy against the private option. So I'm not sure. Because when, I, when people like Maria Chappelle Nadal and Jamila Nasheed um, are, are adamantly for this, I think they're going to bring along Democrats in the House. Because I think I, so, too. And I think that's going to mean that if the Republicans are united on this and they have 106, 107 votes and you get 10 or 15 Democrats voting for this, I think it gets overridden and I think it gets implemented. And it might, there might be a lawsuit over it. I'm not sure. Could be. I, I think that's that's one of the measures that will likely generate legal fights regardless. Yeah. But I can't emphasize enough how important this bill is. It, it impacts people not only in the struggling school districts, but it could impact eventually St. Louis City public schools if they lose accreditation. It impacts Kansas City. It impacts basically hundreds of thousands of people across the state, and it impacts the receiving districts in St. Louis County and St. Charles as well. So... I, th- I see that as the most significant fight or legislation that has yet to be resolved. But I, 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 that's kind of what I feel could happen. Now, one thing I want to mention, uh, there's a common thread in many of the issues, not the, not the transfer bill, but many of the others, is that the re- uh, Republican leaders are trying to get several matters on the August ballot. Not the November ballot, but the August ballot. When I was talking about voter ID, right to work, uh, potentially other things. Um, this is all tied to the philosophy that the uh, electorate in Missouri tends to be more conservative, those who turn out in August because the voter turnout is so low and the Republican base can, is more reliable to turn out. So this is, where, this is what they used in 2004 when they put the gay marriage ban on the ballot. They used August. So you – and uh, – some think that's why they want to put uh, photo ID and right to work and some other things on the August ballot, not the November ballot, where they think uh, you arguably have at least more Democrats and potentially a majority Democrat, depending. So I think uh, this is an underlying trend that's really going to be bolstered this session, but people may not notice it until they see all the ballot issues in August. But get, Speaking of another thing that's going to be on the ballot in August. Yeah, they're, they're, we, we, we spent the first part talking <laughs> about Missouri legislative. We're going to ship closer to home. It, something's going to the dogs. dogs. Oh, we were saving that one up. It was either going to be me or Chris that was going <laughs> to use that horrible catchphrase to yes. introduce this next thing. Yes, the, the big contest on the August ballot right now is St. Louis County Executive. And it's going to be a real rough race. <laughs> yes, and... Uh, <laughs> I hear Stinger had a bone to pick in, in, <laughs> in this battle. Yeah, St. Louis County uh, Councilman Steve Stinger, who's from Afton, is challenging um, County Executive Charlie Dooley in the Democratic primary. Uh, both of them have big-name backers. Both of them have been raising some money. But this week, the news was made when uh, Stinger came out with a news conference on Tuesday to accuse Dooley of being complicit on what he said was way too many killings at the animal shelter. Um, Stinger put out some statistics that come from uh, the county and also from from the state that show that a majority of the animals, dogs and cats, that are turned in at the county uh, shelter end up being euthanized. I think I think it was nearly fifty thousand was was the figure. Well, that he over put out. ten years, Ex- but uh, thank but you that, but yes. annually it's close to sixty percent. It's varied a little bit, but it's generally been over 50. It's between being in the high 50s. Uh, Stanger says that this is an outrage in part because the county paid uh, over $4 million for a new animal shelter and that one of the selling points had been that it would have more room and so they could keep more animals and expand their adoption program. And he's saying that what's happened the last couple of years since it opened is that none of that's happening and still most of the animals turned in are being killed. Now, uh, Stanger, just so you know, has three dogs. And he and his wife actually brought one of their dogs, which was a rescue dog from um, Rolla, which is an interesting story of itself, uh, But which you can read on, on my story on the website. But 
my point is, is that this is the type of issue that uh, may seem superfluous to some, but to Stinger's standpoint, Stinger contends that this is reflective of his, of his broader contention that the health department isn't run well and that Dooley hasn't put good people in and he's citing some of the other health department problems over the last few months. Dooley, in turn, uh, has, has contended that Stinger is engaging in what a spokeswoman called the silly season and that, um, A, uh, he says that the shelter is being run correctly and that the Animals being euthanized are those that are feral or um, ill or have behavioral problems or are old and that just really can't be adopted. Plus, he says that Stanger has known what the, process, what the uh, policies have been at the shelter for years since Stanger's been on the council since 2009. So Dooley's asking why is Stanger just bringing this up now. Stanger says he just found out about it. But... Um, so, this, so what's his plan to improve it? Is it something similar to St. Louis City where they would partner with a correct. no-kill shelter? Correct. In fact, that's what Stanger was highlighting with St. Louis City, saying that look how St. Louis City's done it, that the county should be partnering with some nonprofit groups to encourage adoption, that the county should be promoting its existing spay and neuter program. And he also wants the shelter to be open more. He says that the hours are so constrictive that uh, – People can't go there in the evening or some more on weekends to maybe potentially find an animal that they would like. Now let's just let's just cut down the veneer a little. Okay. Bit. Okay. <laughs> let's do it, Jason. <laughs> this is targeted at people like you, Joe. <laughs> and by people Not like me. you, I mean people who live in Webster Groves, Kirkwood, Creve Core, the Central County, which is going to be the battleground where pets. It is a daily part, Pets are us. <laughs> our daily part of suburban life. This isn't this is necessarily an issue everywhere, but I, I, I see this as trying to target those types of voters of animal lovers and of middle to upper class suburbanites who love dogs. And me and I'm not saying it's not a serious policy proposal or a serious policy issue, but I think that there really is a a a, a I think a pretty direct political uh, potential here. So mm-hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if, if Dooley had a counter proposal trying to do something else. Well, I think this comes as both camps have been circulating some poll numbers that each guy says shows that he's in a strong position. And some consultants were talking to me um, last day or so who have looked at some of the behind the scenes results on both of them and say that there are two, a couple trends in those polls without getting into the numbers that are very similar and which both sides have sort of agreed to. A, uh, I'm, I'm hearing that Dooley's personal favorability is actually reasonably high, but there are some voters who are concerned about what some of the controversies in the, in the administration. On Stanger's side, Stanger's name recognition, even by his own account, is not that good. Well, so I- this is the kind of thing that his allies hope will maybe boost his uh, name recognition, whereas on... Dooley's side, they may see this as an issue for Dooley to highlight how he's been, um, that he got the new shelter and saying that, look, this shows that Dooley's a serious candidate. I hate not. to break it to these consultants, but those polls mean nothing now. I know. I know that. <laughs> There's been no TV ads, and the TV ads are going to move the needle more than any of things like this. And That's why I brought this up, so you can say and, that. And <laughs> If you want any proof of that, look at the lieutenant governor's race of 2012, where I'm sure there was a poll showing Lieutenant Governor Kinder was up like 20 or 30 points. And as soon as loggers started, you know, carpet bombing the airwaves with ads, it turned into a 44-41 race. I'm thinking that's going to be similar here. And I wouldn't trust either side's polls until there are TV ads. Oh, absolutely. But what I'm my point is, is that the, what the polls show are some of the strengths and weaknesses for both candidates is that the Dooley allies acknowledge they need to do stuff to highlight his performance and that Stanger's side needs uh, understands they need to do things to highlight who he is. And this whole animal fight, I mean, it's dogs and cats. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to take a short break. Uh, and when we get back, we will be talking with uh, House Majority Leader John Deal, a Republican from St. Louis County, and we'll be talking about the income tax cut. The okay. the the bottom line is that uh, House Majority Deal ended up in, ended up cre- creating a first for the politically speaking podcast. We did this remote show; it was really good, but somehow in the transmission, this had nothing Technical to do with error. him. 
technical error. Basically, the dog ate the homework, or in this case, uh, the, <laughs> the majority podcast. leader's uh, audio. So it took us about 36 hours to get the um, majority leader back in his office. He was willing to do it again, so special yes. thanks to him. For yeah, special yes, thanks for, for him. Thank for, you. Yes, <laughs> yeah, because we really wanted to um, have him on, and uh, you know, it worked out. And special thanks to Marshall Griffin, our um, Jefferson City correspondent who had to deal with uh, the disaster and then recreating it. So a special shout-out to Marshall as well. All right. Well, we'll be right back. I think Joe's going to set us up here, Joe. Yes. yes. Uh, one of the, the key issues going to last the final few weeks is the tax cut bill that the General Assembly has put on the governor's desk. The tax cut bill, among other things, would um, reduce the uh, percentage that is used to determine how much you tax from 6% for individuals to 5.5%. There would also be a reduction on some business taxes, and it would not begin until 2017, and it hinges on the state income going up at least $150 million a year. So that is the backdrop. The governor, of course, has has some objections to it. Among other things, he contends that there's a sentence in the bill that in effect would mean that all income over $9,000 would not be subject to any income tax. So I'm just laying that uh, groundwork for uh, Representative Deal to dispute that. Go ahead. Right. Yeah, you know, we've talked about that. That's just an absurd conclusion uh, by the governor. Um, You know, the governor's real objection is that he doesn't want to provide broad-based tax relief to all Missourians. He would rather deal with targeted tax cuts or tax cuts for special corporate interests. Um, What we try to do here is to provide something that's broad-based that applies to all taxpayers uh, in proportion to the amount that they pay taxes. So the individual rates would go down uh, from 6% to 5.5% over a five-year period. It's phased in. It only kicks in if there are certain revenue triggers which are met by the state. Uh, In addition, there is a tax uh, deduction available for small businesses, and that affects about 400,000 small businesses in this state. So everything from barber shops to um, small stores on Main Street, professional uh, services organizations, basically any, any entity which is formed as an LLC, sole proprietorship, or S corporation that uh, reports income on the on their that, that way on their tax returns are going to be eligible for a 25 percent reduction in their state income tax burden. Uh, we think it's important that our tax policy reflect an equal playing field for all businesses, and not just be awarding tax breaks for a couple companies that may be politically well connected. Now, the governor also has contended that the tax cut bill would particularly hurt the state's um, money that it uses that goes to public schools, um, that it would force reductions in the public school. And, of course, this is similar to his objection last year. Schools, some of the schools already are putting out estimates on what they claim they might use, lose. Uh, what is your response to those accusations? Well, it's just uh, that's fundamentally untrue. Um, you know, the governor, it, it is true that the governor is using scare tactics uh, with schools to try to generate opposition to a tax cut. Uh, Businesses are not pitted against education, and education should not be pitted against tax cuts. When when our children graduate from schools in the state, they need vibrant, um, healthy places to to work, and businesses that are growing, expanding, and thriving. The numbers that were put out uh, by the governor's office do not take into effect the revenue triggers which are in the bill. Uh, we had, uh, after we saw the governor's false numbers, we had a, a, um, an independent analysis of those numbers uh, prepared by the Missouri Society of Certified Public Accountants um, and looked at it from a school district by school district basis. And every single school district in the state will have more money available to it after the revenue triggers are met uh, with the set-asides for education that are in this tax bill. 
So, the, as, as I'm sure you know, the Republicans have 108 members, and you said before that you're confident that all 108 are going to vote for a potential veto override. Is that correct? Yes, I, 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 I am comfortable that we will have all of our members. And because, you know, there are well, some Democrats that are interested in the in the state and welfare of small businesses and do believe that our tax policy needs to be fair, I do believe uh, this will be a bipartisan override of the governor. Just as when we passed it, it was a bipartisan passing of the bill. With, 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 with yeah. Democrat which voted for it. I was just going to mention that Jeff Rorda of, of Barnhart was the lone Democrat who voted for this. How much is he demanding in order to, uh, and how much leverage does he have? Is he demanding that the state song be turned into his favorite song? You never even call me by my name by David Allen Coe for, for any I didn't reason. even know that was his, his song. I've um, seen him sing it in a karaoke no, I, I before. I have not had any <laughs> direct conversations with Representative Rorta about this, nor did I uh, before the original vote was taken. Look at Representative Rorta lives in a district that has a lot of small businesses. They have a lot of family-owned businesses, and I'm sure he was taking a look at uh, he's also running for higher office. He's running for a Senate seat in Jefferson County. And I'm sure he's taken a look at his future elections to know that voters want tax relief. Voters want tax cut. Small businesses need help. Small businesses need tax relief and regulatory relief. And I am certain when he voted, he was looking out uh, for the interest of his constituents. Um, I feel comfortable uh, that um, you know, he's not going to play politics and get bullied by the governor to change his vote. Uh, that being said, you know, irrespective of what Representative Florida decides to do, I am confident that we have other Democrats that will come along. Now, there have been some critics who have pointed out that um, in a separate issue, but it does affect it, uh, the this General Assembly has yet to uh, pass a provision regarding the uh, tobacco settlement in the state, which in effect could cost the state that's estimated about $7 million in income this year and more in future years. Uh, I know that there's various disagreements over who's at fault over this, but the bottom line is Missouri is the only state that hasn't passed the particular provision that's needed yeah. to do that. I'm interested in your, your take on that because I know you're very familiar with, sure. that, with that bill and for, for the potential all, I, loss. I, I, I support that legislation. I've sponsored it in the past. Um, that being said, uh, that does that has nothing to do with the current shortfall that Missouri is receiving in tobacco settlement money. Uh, the current shortfall that we have is due uh, to an arbitration ruling against the state uh, for enforcement of our laws uh, several, I believe, as much as 10 years ago. And that's when uh, the current governor was the attorney general, and the arbitration award is very clear that the the reason uh, arbitrate, the arbitrators ruled against Missouri was that it, then Attorney General Nixon did not diligently enforce uh, Missouri's laws regarding uh, the tobacco settlement. And that's, I think, almost indisputable when looking at the arbitration award. Now, that being said, you know, I think we probably we do need to close <coughs> the loopholes. And let me go back. The arbitration award also indicated that the award against Missouri had nothing to do with the action or inaction of the General Assembly uh, back at the time that the arbitration award covered. Now, that being said, I think there are opportunities for the state by passing this complementary legislation that there can be new settlements with some of these tobacco companies to try to recover some of these monies that were lost due to the lack of diligent enforcement under Attorney General Nixon. So. Another thing that has come up, I guess today, actually, in the Senate is the Senate actually— Breaking news, in fact. The Senate has passed a new version of the, the transportation tax. It was 1 percent. It is down to 0.75 percent, which means it goes back to the House. Um, as I kind of asked you in our first take, there are some are saying there's a mixed message here of Republicans pushing the sales tax increase for transportation and an income tax hike or income tax decrease. I know that you disagree with that. Um, what's kind of your take on that? That well, situation. I mean, first of all, it, 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 the, the only mixed message that's out there is the governor trying to flop sweat on, on how to avoid 
uh, a conversation on income tax reductions. Um, the, the sales tax proposal, uh, which is before the General Assembly, which is something the governor supported apparently until just a few weeks ago, um, is the constitutional way for us to deal with roads and bridges. So if, if, if we, you know, the, the, the gasoline tax has not kept up with the road needs uh, due to maintenance issues, due to um, the lack of federal monies which were once available that are not available anymore, uh, also fuel efficiency in cars and alternative fuel vehicles which are not taxed with the gasoline tax. Now that being said, the way to consider whether or not we should raise more money for roads and bridges and for safe roads and bridges is to put a question before the voters. It's, it's the way, it's the process that, that, that is implemented. So all the attorney, all the General Assembly is doing is allowing the voters to decide whether or not they believe uh, that there is a sufficient need for more road and bridge money and to have it funded by that way. So it's, it's not an endorsement or actually a vote for that. It's, it's a vote to allow the voters to decide under our Constitution how those things are to be funded. But you're, you're not optimistic that when it goes to the voters it's going to pass, are you? I think it's got a tough road. Why? Ha, 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 ha. Come on, Pun funny. intended. Good Why? See, come on, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Thanks Very for the funny. levity. <laughs> Why do you think it's going to be difficult to sell this to the public? I mean, it has the support of Claire McCaskill and a bunch of Republicans as well. Seems yeah, like I, it. You know, I, I just I, I didn't say it's not going to happen. I, I just think it's it, it, it's going to be a tough sell. I think the proponents are going to have to clearly explain uh, what the benefits are going to be to the public, why this additional funding is needed, and that the money is being spent in a in a responsible manner. I, I don't think that it's uh, an insurmountable burden. I just think it's going to be a, a tough sell, and I think the public will, will you know, is going to look at it uh, with the proper amount of skepticism and, and hold uh, and, and hold the proponents accountable. Now, at the same time, all this is going on. Uh, you've got the governor putting out a new proposal for Medicaid expansion. Um, his proposal now would send the federal money to small businesses to basically um, subsidize a substantial part of their costs for providing insurance for lower-income workers who now um, earn too little to qualify to be on the insurance exchanges, but because we don't have regular Medicaid expansion, they wouldn't be under Medicaid. What is your thoughts about this late proposal? Is it anything that the General Assembly would even consider at this point, or just what are your, what are your general so I, I have some you know, general thoughts about it. N number one, it's it's you know two and a half weeks left in the session, and if it's a serious proposal, it probably should have been brought up earlier than yesterday. Um, I, if it's a good idea, we'll look at it, and we'll consider it, and we'll see if it makes sense. Um, given the timing of it, it seems like it's a little bit of a, a gimmick or a distraction to try to distract voters from the small business tax cut which the governor is trying to avoid talking about directly. Uh, number two, if the governor were serious about it, uh, I believe it's about 24 steps uh, from the governor's office to the chambers of either the House or the Senate. And even now we're about 36 hours since his initial announcement. I'm not aware of anybody in leadership in either body that's been contacted directly from the governor's office about this proposal uh, what it means, how it would be implemented, and what needs to be done to try to bring it to fruition in the last two weeks. So within these last two weeks, what are some of the priorities? What are, what are some of the things that you're going to be focusing on here? Okay. Well, first we have to finish the budget up. So we're going to probably put the budget bills. The, the, the House has passed a budget. Uh, the Senate has passed a budget. I think structurally uh, the House and the Senate are, are on the same page. And we're going to get those budgets to conference between the two bodies and try to get that figured out over the next week or so. We need to pass a budget uh, by next Friday, and I'm comfortable that we'll be able to uh, get that done. Uh, we're obviously going to 
either be celebrating a tax cut for all small businesses in the state, or we'll be entertaining a veto override either later this week or early next week. Um, and then we're also going to have to deal with the implications of whether or not the governor vetoes or signs the uh, historic criminal code revision bill, uh, which we passed last week. Now, I know that there's also been a hang-up over the right-to-work proposal, which is aimed at putting on the ballot in August a uh, proposal that would, in effect, uh, bar unions or employers from operating closed union shops where all workers would have to pay a fee regardless if they want to be a member of the union. Uh, I know the House has been four votes short of the number needed to to get this proposal to the Senate, which also would have to vote before it would go on the ballot. The governor is opposed to it, but the governor does not have a role in if something is putting on the ballot. What is, what's the latest uh, as far as trying to get those extra four votes? Well, for, first, by, by way of historical background, this proposal has moved farther in the General Assembly than it has ever in history. Uh, it, it, for the first time, was voted out of committee, put on the calendar, and received a positive majority vote on the House floor. Uh, that being said, as you point out, Joe, that uh, at least on the perfection vote, it was four votes shy of what's, of what's called a constitutional majority, which is necessary to pass the bill out of the House and send it over to the Senate. So that's something that we're evaluating right now in light of all the other priorities that we're dealing with. And I suspect a decision will be made on that in the next week or so. Okay, one more question before we, we let you go. So in in the possibility or in the scenario where the tax cut, this particular tax cut does not get overridden, would the House or the Senate entertain passing another version of it and then trying to override it during veto session when they will when the Republicans will likely have two more members in the House? I think that that's one possibility. Another possibility the Senate is considering, too, and just backing up a little bit, you know, we, we consider this tax cut bill to be a compromise over what was done last, you know, last summer that the governor objected to. And we were told last summer that the governor and the opponents of the tax cut would want to see triggers in the bill, so to be guaranteed that revenues are increasing before the tax cuts um, went into effect. We were told that the governor and the opponents wanted to see a smaller tax cut, so we cut this tax cut basically in half from what it was last summer, and it's still objectionable. So another possibility which is on the table also is that the Senate is entertaining the idea of putting you know, the, the original income tax cut bill without all the sales tax issues uh, back into a bill and putting what's called a referendum clause on it so we can put it on the ballot in August of this year and let the voters decide whether or not they'd like to see broad-based tax relief. Wow, that's big news. Big news. Although I'm sure that's already been reported, but that would I mean, presumably, in, if you had that in August, the turnout's going to be a lot lower than November, so the chance of it passing and mobilizing Republican voters could be higher. So I agree. So uh, To close us out here, you can read all of our stories at stlpublicradio.org. You can follow me on Twitter at C.S. McDaniel. Jason, you can be followed on Twitter. Jay Rosenbaum. Joe, you can be followed on Twitter. At Jay Manis. That's J-M-A-N-N-I-E-S. And Representative, you can be followed on Twitter. At John Deal Jr. That's J-O-H-N-D-I-E-H-L-J-R. Very good. Well, we'll be back next week. Until then, so long. So long. Thank you.